All right. I'd like to welcome you all to Fit and 15. Some of you may not even knew we were here. This is a personal training facility that we recently opened up here in the Camp Verde area, serving the entire Verde Valley, and we're just uh, thrilled to have all of you here. Uh, people have been coming from all over to uh, see what's going on. I know we've got someone from Sedona here and from uh, all the areas. And also, well, I should introduce myself. My name is Dick Nunez, and myself and my wife Lisa in the purple shirt over there. We're the owners of this little facility. And then we have uh, Dr. Jay Sutliff, who is a professor at Northern Arizona University. He's a PhD and a registered dietitian. And then he and his wife Chloe, back there on the black, white striped dress there. Um, we started this online health ministry called Optimize for Life. And the whole purpose is if we're to educate people, understanding how their body works, understanding health and so forth. And so we have a different concept of how we're going to be doing this. In fact, actually this program is going to be filmed uh, at a worldwide Christian broadcasting uh, station later on in August, so we'll be doing that there. So, uh, Jay, do you have anything you'd like to add before we get going here? Um, Dick and I have known each other for 20, 20 years. 20 yeah. years, worked together at the health center right. in Black Hills, and kind of our paths now come back and cross together. Right. Wow. So, in fact, he and his wife, Chloe, are one of the reasons why we're here. So we moved to the Verde Valley in the first place. So, okay. so we're looking forward to working together. And uh, so this will be kind of a trial run for us. And so uh, we'll go ahead and get going. Okay. So, so the ba there's many different ways to present health. And we've done different types of seminars where Dick will get up and do a, a portion, then I'll get up and do a portion. Chloe will do a cooking class, and we'll do those types of things. We're kind of combining our efforts here. And, what we're looking at, right, we're going to take what's called a systems approach. And that's the way they teach med school nowadays, is they, they take the systems of the body and they go through the systems of the body. But we don't, the main thing we don't want you to lose sight of is the picture of the whole. Okay, we don't want you to get so lost looking at the cardiovascular system or something like that that you forget there's a the whole body involved. But really, the basis of what we're going to be doing is presenting, is look at this, if we can preserve the vigor of every organ, we will experience optimum health and guard against disease. We're not going to talk a lot about disease. We're going to talk a lot about prevention and optimizing your system so you don't have to worry about the disease. Okay? And so we're going to try to take 15 minutes per topic. Okay? Now, I don't know how long Dick takes for a presentation usually, but I'm programmed for either a 50-minute class or a 90-minute class. And we're going to put four, four topics in tonight and four tomorrow night. Okay? So hyperspeed, let's go. Okay. We're going to start with the skeletal system. Everybody has a skeletal system, right? So Dave, why don't you tell us a little bit about, we're using this thing called science faction. You've heard a lot of science fiction? These are actually science facts called science faction. So talk about the, Dave, why don't you tell us about the anatomy, physiology, how the bones are made up in the body. Now, a lot of people don't understand how their skeletal system is made up. And as you see right off, you have 206 individual bones. It's a very complex network. And some of the bones, uh, you think of them as very minor until you break one. And so, very complex. Uh, we have what's called an endoskeletal system, where it's inside of the body. There's a little creature around this area that has an exto ectoskeletal system. You know what it's called? Scorpion. 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 Yeah. Yeah, they have a skeleton on the outside. Lovely little critters. Uh, the skeletal system provides strength, stability, and protection of organs. Facilitates movement. Now, understand something. People oftentimes will say to me, I have weak joints. Everybody has weak joints. If we had a skeleton here, a cadaver or a model, you'd find that it has really loose, floppy joints because a joint is simply a bone coming into bone hooked by ligaments. What gives that joint strength is the muscles. Okay? I have very small hands. James probably not much bigger. Uh, but so a lot of people say, well, you have really weak hands because they're small. No, no. Because when I squeeze my hand, something else is happening. The muscles of my forearm are contracting. So my hand strength isn't based upon how big my hand is. My hand strength is based upon how strong my forearms are. Or people often say, well, I've got arthritis in my knees, so I'm not going to do any exercise. Worst thing you could do. Because if you don't have the strength in your quadriceps and your hamstrings, all the stress is going to be on your knee. 
In fact, once upon a time, I landed badly. Last time I dunked a basketball, I was 38 years old. I landed, my leg went out to the side, and I thought, oh, I'm in trouble. And I got up, and I hobbled off, and, well, I can still walk. Oh, I'm so thankful, because I thought I was going to have to have surgery. Now, my knee clicked for a while as I walked, but eventually I got so I was playing racquetball, basketball, doing anything I wanted to do. Well, years later, when I was the director at the Black Hills Health and Education Center, where Jay and I worked together, one of our doctors was a orthopedic surgeon. And I said, uh, could you check my knee? And he said, well, have you had a traumatic knee injury? You know what I'm talking about. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I, I did. He goes, you have a torn ACL. Well, you hear about torn ACLs in sports. I mean, it puts people down. And I said, well, doctor, how could I still walk? And he goes, the muscles, your quadricep muscles, have stabilized you to the point where you can still go on. So even if you have arthritis in your knees, exercise is a key component to help you to keep moving well so you won't have problems. So smallest bones are found in the, in the ear. The longest bones in the body is the femur. The femur is your leg bone. The bones are filled with a fatty substance called bone marrow. In the marrow you'll find red and white blood cells that are manufactured, at least in the bloodstream, very important aspect of the bones. And over half the body's bones are your hands and feet, very complex network of bones, especially if you've ever broken your wrist, broken your foot, you know, a lot of little muscle, or little bones in there. And the only jointless bone in your body is a high bone bone in your throat. So the bones are very important. And also, this is the place where the body will leach calcium if it starts getting trouble. And I'm sure Jay will talk about that a little bit more. Okay, so when, when you think about building your bone tissue, up until about the age of 30, you're laying down bone tissue. Okay, so there's only a one or two people in this room. <laughs> How old your dog? <laughs> Is that time seven then you get their age by time seven? We basically are laying down what we did up until about age 30, what we were eating, how much uh, weight bearing exercise we were doing, we were laying down the bone mass and after that we're kind of on cruise control, we can maintain it. It's difficult to rebuild it. Now has anybody been diagnosed with osteoporosis or thinning of the bones and things like that? Okay. So what we need to look at is do some things here that you can do to maintain or try to even gain a little bit back. But most of your bone is laid down until about the age of 30. Okay? Now it's interesting that when they look at discus throwers and shot putters and stuff like that, and they compare the bone mass on the two arms, okay, which, which, which arm do you think is much denser in, in bone tissue? The throwing arm, right? Okay, so the types of things we were doing up until 30, maybe some of you were throwing hay bales and hauling water and hauling wood and stuff like that, but today's sedentary activity, we're going to probably see osteoporosis uh, rates skyrocket over the next generation as the baby boomers get a little bit older and stuff like that, we have more sedentary jobs, okay? So what we want to look at is the body part that forms the supporting structure of the body, we're talking about that bone mass, and we typically always think about, when we, I'm a nutritionist, so when I think, think about that, what, what do we first of all think about what nutrient? What's the calcium? Okay, so obviously calcium helps build the bone density, but we also want to look at other, other elements with that as well. And one of the things we have to look at is one of the, the things that people consume, especially young girls, that's absolutely devastating for the bones is pop, yeah. and diet pop. Yeah. And it makes the body very acidic. It takes uh, like 32 glasses of water to neutralize the pH of one can of pop. And so they're way behind the thing. And so nutritional experts have said, you think osteoporosis is bad now? Wait until the current group of girls gets up into adulthood. It's going to be much, much worse. So very important to uh, strengthen the bones and, and to worry about or think about uh, what you're doing to yourself that's going to cause the bones to leach. Because the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition once stated, calcium-related diseases caused by a lack of calcium consumption is not known to occur in humans at all. Now there are calcium related diseases, but it's not caused by a lack of calcium consumption. It's caused by lifestyle problems that are due to, or that are causing the bone, the calcium leaching. Again, Jay will probably talk about that. Now for a lot of you ladies who are members of Fit and 15, what is one of the main things I stress with you if you do this? What do I say? Posture, right? Posture. Why? Because when women stand like this, 
it causes an upper rounding of the upper thoracic vertebrae, which is a weak Achilles heel of women, as they, especially as they get older. So they're going to put their hands on their hips and be like that, so they're upright. But people in general, their posture is terrible. And so when we, when we don't have good posture, and again, one of the things that gives you good posture is your muscles. Because if your muscles are weak, thunk. Or if you have an imbalance of muscle, you might have sway back, you can have other problems. And when you start to, to pull the spine one direction or another, you're going to have problems. Okay. okay, so the other thing is we want to look at is if you ever watch people when they go to sit in chairs, they just kind of fall into the chair. We're going to follow the skeletal system with the muscular system because they go hand in hand. Right. So let's look at some of the, the things we can do on a daily basis to make sure that we're maintaining our bone mass, okay, our bone density. So we first look at the, the strengthening and so forth. We'll talk about strengthening and weight bearing resistance and I'll talk about the nutrients. Okay. Anytime you stress a bone, by putting resistance on it, you're going to create like this this thing of tension in there, and it's going to release. Uh, it's going to release in or release it. What what word am I? It's, it's going to draw in the the, 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 the yeah. charges, the okay. charges, and it's going to be drawing in the calcium to make it stronger. Because anytime, and Jay was right on right on the target. When you stress a bone, it's going to get it's going to get larger and stronger. And the reason why men have less osteoporosis than women is because they have larger bones to begin with. But they still can get it. Still has to be something they're aware of. So, and then it's very vital to strengthen the muscles of the, of the spinal column. So all the muscles that are around your back, you know, like your shoulder blades, you all know about your shoulder blades? It's called the scapula. There's actually 16 muscles attached to each side there. So very complex network of muscles that hold you up and back. And so when you stimulate the muscles of the central nervous system right along the spine, it sends out signals to the entire body to draw calcium in to the bone matrix. And vital thing, women even in their 70s can increase their bone matrix without using any type of drugs. Just by exercising, the bone matrix will get stronger. Okay, so let's take a look at now some of the nutrients. We've talked about calcium, and the obvious food is what for that? For yeah. calcium? Dairy. For dairy products. Okay, now the interesting thing is the same clinical journal that, that Dick talked about will also report that the United States has one of the highest consumption per capita per person of calcium. We also have the highest rates of osteoporosis, so it's not a calcium deficiency or a lack of calcium. It's about the absorption and utilization of the calcium. So with calcium needs to come magnesium. They need, they're, they're like twin sisters or twin brothers or whatever you want, twin siblings. Okay, calcium and magnesium together. You also need some other minerals, potassium, vitamin D, vitamin K. And I'm gonna give you a sheet tonight, a handout before you go home where you can actually start making choices. Did you know that, where do you think the cow gets their calcium? Do they go to another cow and drink the milk from the cow? Grass. Get it from grass. Okay, so it's better to eat your grass than smoke it, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so green leafy vegetables on a daily basis, you actually absorb as much or more from the plant sources as you do the animal sources. Because the animal sources are also very high in protein. And so there's a kind of a double whammy there, okay? Uh, the thing that Dick talked about too is the blood pH. Uh, that may be a little bit too technical, but basically what we want to do is look at, see if we can't start getting more of our calcium from plant sources of food. Does that make sense? Okay, because then typically too, the calcium-magnesium ratio in the plant foods is more balanced than from the animal protein. Okay, and then we talk about minimizing, like Dick talked about, minimizing the phosphorus levels, and that's in processed foods, that's in, that's in uh, sodas things like that, and that actually leaches the calcium out of the bone. Okay, so... so the dark sodas are just all sodas. all sodas. It's the phosphorus content of the soda. Phosphoric acid. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so basically what we're looking at is getting it from whole food types of uh, food constituents, okay? And we're trying to minimize the process, which because they put phosphorus in there for uh, preservatives as well. And then, so then what we try to do is minimize the overload of animal protein. Also, caffeine will actually leach, leach some calcium out of the system as well. And uh, caffeine is also a diuretic. It will actually cause you to urinate more, and you're going to be leaching more out and more out. So you'll be putting it in here, and then it's going out in the, in the, the kidneys and so forth. And sometimes, 
That side of that is, uh, anybody had a kidney stone? But basically, the kidney stone is made up of basically a calcium rock huh. caught in the uh, urinary tract. And then also alcohol. Yeah. Will have the same type of it's diuretic same type effect, diuretic effect. Okay. So right from the beginning here, we're going to be a killjoy. <laughs> take, take, okay. You're still drinking water. Yeah. <laughs> So there's the alcohol tobacco, and then we'll just talk about what, what the combination of the nutrients and exercise, load-bearing exercise. Build that matrix up. Well, um, whenever you um, whenever you exercise, you need the proper nutrients in order to rebuild. Protein is one that we think about oftentimes, but it can't be too much because if you have too much protein, then it's going to cause again, it's going to get into calcium leaching. Because when your body, and we talk, your body needs to be in a proper pH balance. We alluded to it just a little bit. If you're too acid, that's where disease starts and so forth. So too much, too much animal products, too much protein causes problems. So you want to get your body more alkaline. How do you get your body more alkaline? By eating more fresh fruits and vegetables and so on and so forth. So when you are stimulating your body, and I always tell people this, one of the reasons why we only use a 15-minute workout program here is because we stimulate, let people rest, and recover. Because if you overdo it, you're going to break yourself down too much. So getting the proper nutrients back in. And also, for those who want to metabolize fat, and they try and do various types of programs, they do walking, they try and cut their diet, and so on and so forth. When you release fatty acids, they're in a fat-soluble state, and they're very toxic. And if you don't have the proper nutrients to convert them into a water soluble, the body will restore them back in the fat tissue more toxic than they ever were before. So it's really important to have the vital nutrients. And so when, when we talk about eating, and I know Jay will allude to this more, we talk about eating a lot of nutrient-dense foods. Let food be your medicine. Hippocrates said that way back when. And so we want to uh, focus on that because when you have those type of foods, then you're going to maximize your muscle development and your bone tissue. I am a total vegetarian and have been one for 35 years. Once upon a time, I used to eat three pounds of meat, a gallon of milk, and a half dozen eggs a day. So I ate 10,000 calories a day. I ate seven times a day. I got so I hated eating because I'm not naturally large. And Jay can relate to it. We both tend to be a little bit on the smaller side, but yet we both had, what do you call it, bigorexia? We both wanted to be big, you know, and so on and so forth. And so, so we did whatever we could, but yet we, we didn't have the genetic hand that some people have where they just get, you know, massively big easily. So getting those vital nutrients, and that's what I focus on, maximizing nutrients. And so people say, well, how do you, how can you do that on a vegetarian diet? Well, what are the strongest, biggest land animals in the world? Vegetarians. Elephants, you know, so on and so forth. They're all vegetarians. Even a gorilla, you know, we look at a gorilla, they have lots of muscle. They're vegetarians. Yeah. So that that's that's the uh, skeletal system. <clears throat> any any questions on, on that portion? Things rattling around in your head that you want to ask? Right now would be a good time. We might forget it by the time we get done. We're going to transition to the muscular system next. Good to go? Well, mine is kind of a personal one, and I can wait about dehydrated. Uh, like amazing grass and things like that that I put in as opposed to eating a lot of leafy fresh yeah. vegetables. Is yeah. that still? That is still, she's talking about a, a green pro protein or a green drink powder, yeah. granulated powder, dried young plants, granulated, that's a, that's a good step as well. I mean, I also eat a yeah. lot of leafy, but I, you, do. you can only eat so much. But you leafy. boost it with the amazing grain, grass, Correct. amazing grass brand supplement. Yeah. yeah, great idea. Okay. Yeah. Extra greens there. Anything else? Questions? Go ahead. I'll just make a comment. I told Rita to kick me in the rear if, talking about posture, if I go to the grocery store and I lean over the cart and, and let the cart just kind of drop me through, you know how I know. You yeah. have, there's a tendency to you know, just use it as a walker. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, so that, that could be a thing that we... That's a good thing. And if, and if we're going to be in a sedentary society, the way we sit, even our posture when we're sitting, they know so you, some of you probably start straightening up now, but actually we're going to get to that a little bit with respiration. But even the way we sit, okay, we droop over and we fall over and things like that. So yeah, have a have a deal with somebody that you know straighten your posture, sit Don't up straight. Your head. 
What's that? Walk around with a book on your head. Yeah, that's right. In fact, in fact, Joe Weider used to have a thing that it was a buzzer that they put on your belt, and you'd set it to an exact spot where you're where you feel good about how you're standing, and then if you lean forward too much, it would buzz, <laughs> which might be embarrassing in public. Was it? That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> train, train the muscles. Yeah, so train the muscles. Train the muscles. Exactly. And it was guaranteed to take a couple inches off your waist in like a couple weeks because you know you just learn to stand straighter if you operate it. We had a guy at our athletic club who lost 150 pounds. And big man, about six foot four, about 365 pounds, lost 150 pounds, got down to 215. But he'd come up to me and go, hey, how do I get rid of this? Stand up straight. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> and then you know, a couple weeks later he'd come back and he goes, hey, I still can't get rid of this. Stand up straight, Bob. Oh yeah, you know, because you know, just standing up straight makes a big difference. <laughs> okay, so there, there's the skeletal system. Now we're going to go into the muscular system. And uh, Dick, why don't you introduce the, the muscular system? Oh, uh, there's all sorts of great stuff in here. Your body is so incredibly made, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. You have, you have an mu individual muscle that just moves your little finger, and the muscles work together in harmony to, to keep you moving. And you don't even think about how incredible this is. I mentioned earlier about the importance of, of this area right here. These muscles right here, the scapular muscles, you know, so many people, I mean, we don't see it because it's underneath, but so many people will wake up in the morning with like a, a sore neck, kink in the neck, and they go, oh, I just, my, I just don't feel good back here. And, they, they, and I know you have to deal with it a lot as a massage therapist, but there's a muscle back here called the later scapulae that goes from the superior angle, or from C1 through 4 down to the superior angle of the scapula, and if that goes into any type of contraction, I know Chloe, you have to deal with that one a lot too, it's also a massage therapist, and I have another one in here, yeah, you're a massage therapist too, so all of you massage therapists know exactly what I'm talking about, because the brachial plexus nerve network runs right underneath that, and so if that, if that levator scapula goes into some type of contraction, it's not just going to cause a little, little bit of pain, it's going to cause a lot of pain because of the nerve network underneath there, just like in your lower back, you have muscle called the piriformis, which is one of the six deep lateral rotators of the hip, which is right underneath here. And if that goes into any type of contraction, what runs right underneath that? Sciatic, sciatic nerve. nerve. Yeah. And so a lot of people will have sciatica, and you know their, their foot hurts, it hurts on the back of their leg, and, and they, want, they want you to, to treat their feet or the back of their leg. Well, you know, it's not going to help. You've got to get to the ear. And so a lot of times people will go get a laminectomy, some type of severe thing, or they just take drugs or whatever, but they never get to the root of the problem, which is simply getting the piriformis to relax and release. And one of the reasons why that happens is because of flexibility. And men especially are not very flexible. Now, I'm not talking about emotionally, ladies. I'm talking about physically, especially in the hamstrings. If you don't have good flexibility in your hamstrings, it's going to set you up for problems back here. Biggest, strongest muscle in the body, right here. Gluteus maximus muscles. Now, I know a lot of ladies will joke, oh, well, mine's starting to slide down the back of my legs. But, but men, you know, you have women say, my, my husband, it looks like somebody took the air valves out from underneath each cheek and just boom, it's gone. My husband has no bottom. Well, you show me a man that doesn't have a bottom anymore, I'll show you a man who's going to have problems with his back. Yeah. Because those muscles are designed to be developed. Those are the muscles that extend the hip. And, you know, it's so amazing. You know, I, I, you get a lot of people who think they already have it figured out. And unfortunately, men, we tend to be that way. We already think we got it all figured out. I already know what to do. I don't need anybody telling me what to do. Well, then do it. <laughs> then do it. Because by developing these muscles, and, and you find this happening, in fact, when we were in Rapid City, one of our clients was a nurse whose husband was a cardiologist. He's 67 years old, he goes, I don't need it. I, I don't need to train, I don't need to work out. Finally, he showed up a year later, started working out. He's like, no, don't leave. Don't go, don't go to Arizona. What am I gonna do now? Because he was just hooked. Because men start working out and they go, wow, I feel like I'm, 30 years younger, we, have a, we had an old fellow in Hermosa, he was 82 years old and he worked out and he goes, you know, this is great. Feller comes in here, pulls a few levers and I'm good as new again, we go back to work. So, so getting these muscles going, they're all designed to work. If you don't use them, 
They you lose them. them. And that's what's depicted over here. This is a 40-year-old triathlete. This is, this is basically the quadricep muscle from, the, from a top view. There's the bone in the middle. And you can see the, uh, the osteoporosis is the losing of the bone mass. There's something called sarcopenia, which is a losing of muscle mass as we age. Just like we, we, we worry about osteoporosis, when's the last time you worried about sarcopenia? You didn't even know what that was, right? You're losing muscle tissue. Okay? Here's a 74-year-old sedentary man. What's this marbling right here? Fat. That's, that's fat. That's like a steak at the, at the grocery store with the marbling on it in activity. Here's a 70-year-old triathlete here. So you don't necessarily, it's, it's actually uh, not even as difficult to maintain your muscle mass as your bone mass. Does that make sense? So in a sense, like, it's, it, it's actually, it's easier to maintain muscle than oh, it is easier. bone. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I maybe said that kind of awkwardly there. So what we're looking at here is that, and like Dick said, you can kind of make up for maybe some of the lo uh, lost bone mass or you didn't lay down good bone mass in your 30s. You can kind of make up for it by extra muscle mass. Now, what do we? What, what do most women say when you talk to a woman about lifting weights? I don't want to what? I don't want to get too muscular. Yeah, I don't want to get too big. Well, you know, Dick and I, we've been popping weights for a lot. It's hard enough for us to try it out big. Okay, yeah. so ladies, don't don't worry about getting. You know, you don't like wake up, in, day. Yeah. wake up in the morning and you're busting out of your pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I always say, like, it's hard enough for men to look like men. Yeah, don't worry that's about right. It. So <laughs> the muscles typically look at look at the muscles make up about forty percent of your total body weight. Now the interesting thing is, is you could take a person who's you know five eight one sixty, and you could have somebody who's maybe soft, maybe has thirty percent body fat. You can take that 5, 8, 160, and you can transform their body composition. So don't worry about what the scale is saying, okay? Because muscle member is a lot more dense. Right. So you can transform your body. You can lose body fat and gain muscle. You may not change on the scale. That's the first thing when I worked in health clubs and put people on fitness programs, the ladies would get upset with us because they'd come back and say, oh, I'm not losing any weight. In fact, I'm gaining weight. Right. But I say, oh, are you losing inches? Yeah, I've lost five inches on my waist. But the scale isn't going down. We're so riveted. To this thing right over here, okay? Let's not get locked up in that. And in fact, let me interject something. Yeah. I've actually seen women gain weight and lose dress sizes. Yeah. yeah. I've seen people, women, lose weight and gain in dress sizes. Yeah. Because a pound of fat is over two and a half times the size of a pound of muscle. Oh, really? And and here's the thing that's just really staggering is that people seem to think if they want to lose fat that they need to just do cardio. And that's not true. You need to get in the resistance training because the resistance training will make you more effective at burning body fat. When you have a good weight workout, you're burning fat at a higher level for five to six hours. When you do aerobic workout, you're only burning fat at a higher level for an hour. And then one of the great things we have, we talk, probably get alluded to a little bit later, is human growth hormone, which is like the anti-aging chemical the body produces. When you do aerobic exercise, that goes up 100%. When you do a weight training workout, it goes up 400 to 800 percent. So very important to get in there and make those muscles work. Okay, Jay? Nope. Now the interesting thing is, did you know that you actually have muscles in the roots of your hair? <laughs> That's where the goosebumps or the chicken skin, whatever you call that. That's actually month. You're actually you can't count that as lifting weights, though. <laughs> now, here's an interesting thing: is that you're born with all the muscle fibers you're ever going to have. It's just that they either hypertrophy get larger or atrophy gets smaller. Okay, it's not like the bone where you actually can lose it, so to speak. The muscle tissue is still there, basically from the womb, and we just want to tone it. Okay, so let's start taking a look at some of the other information, like 700 muscles and different things like that. How about the three types of muscle, Dick? Visceral, the cardiac, skeletal. Well, visceral muscles, as you see, are involuntary muscles because we cannot control them. <coughs> it's controlled by parts of your brain. Cardiac muscle, is a muscle that's found only in your heart. It's job is to pump blood throughout the body. When you look at the heart, what an incredible organ it is. I mean, it's just absolutely amazing. In fact, an interesting thing, uh, Muhammad Ali, when he died, it took like 20 to 30 minutes for his heart to find his stuff, even after he was dead. Because no they said he had such an amazing heart. Wow. Yeah. Uh, skeletal muscle, a muscle that, that creates movement. Skeletal muscle includes blood vessels, tendons, and nerves that provide strength and stability to the joints. And like Jay said, it's hard to build muscle mass, you really have to work at it. Um, I'll be 61 in, next month, and I've been doing this for a long, long time. And even though at my age, I still go after it because I want to try and push that envelope. 
because people have a misconception of what we should look like when we're old, older, excuse me. Uh, because there are cultures out there, like the Hunzas and some of those people, in their 90s, they're still vibrant and healthy. Their minds are still clear. Their bones are still dense because of the lifestyle they lead and so on and so forth. So a lot of people say, well, I don't want to live to be 100 because they have this illusion of what they're going to look like at that. But here's the, the good part is we can change that anytime we start. Everybody here, if everybody here for the next six months adhere to an exercise program put forth by me and a dietary program put forth by this man, how do you think you'd look in six months? Great. Your body would transform and you would have a, a feeling of vibrancy of life because the number one sign you're getting old is you're getting weak. You can no longer get up, you can no longer move, you can no longer do the things you used to do. And, it, and again, as it says there, never too late to start. Never too late to start because they're, they've done people even in their 90s, get them exercising and within, within two months they can increase their strength threefold. And what does that mean? They're getting rid of wheelchairs, they're getting rid of walkers, they're able to leave a nursing home because now they can take care of themselves again. Because a lot of people are in nursing homes, not because they're mentally gone, it's because they're physically gone. How many, how many of you have, how many do not have access to the internet? Is anybody? Okay, but you can, you can maybe get there. Go to a website called bluezones.com. Blue like the color, and zones like a time zone. Bluezones.com, there's nine, uh, demographers went around the world, researchers went around the world, and they found pockets of people that are living to be 100 years old with vitality. Not in nursing homes and, and debilitated situations. There's, there's uh, five zones in the world where there's pockets of people who are living to be 100 years old with vitality more so than the rest of the world. Okay? There, there's there, over in Europe, Central America, and there's one in, in North America, in the United States, in Southern California. Okay, Loma Linda, California. My wife was actually born in a sanitarium over there. Okay, that tells you the age there of the sanitarium. <laughs> the interesting wow, nice thing job, is, Jay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she was talking about it this morning. Oh, okay, she, that's she, not possible. She actually said she was born in a sanitarium this morning. <laughs> so the interesting thing is going there. There's nine habits that these people practice on a regular basis, regardless of where they live. These five groups of people around the world. And the main thing is one of, one of them is regular exercise. And it's not necessarily they have to go to a gym to work out. It's they put it into their everyday activity, they're more physically active. Okay? So with the bone system comes the muscular system. Again, the micronutrients, we talked about sarcopenia. Okay? Magnesium is extremely important for maintaining your muscle mass. Magnesium, and I'm going to share with you a little bit later uh, some other things that you can do to get more magnesium into your diet naturally. And then I'll just share it right now. There's a, there's a supplement. It's a powder, and I typically don't promote certain brands or products and things like that. I don't try to push those types of things, but there's a, there's a product called uh, Calm, C-A-L-M. It's a magnesium supplement. It's a little powder. kind of fizzes up. Remember how Alka-Seltzer, I'm saying used to, they still make Alka-Seltzer? Sure. I'm sure, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My dad used to take it all the time because he had acid reflux. Right. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. How many have acid reflux? Good. Well, we'll get rid of that in a week. Okay? That, that's worth the price of admission right there. That's that ain't anything. Get, get some, get some <laughs> calm. Magnesium. If you have difficulty sleeping, okay, you want to make sure you're not, eat, uh, you're not eating enough magnesium, you want to get this product called Calm and you just take a, like a quarter of a teaspoon in a little bit of water, dissolve it, and drink it before you go to sleep. Now the interesting thing is we're really good at getting calcium, which is muscle contraction. But what do you think? The muscle's contracted now. What helps it relax? Magnesium. Magnesium. So if we have a lot of calcium in there, we go to bed at night. A lot of times we're tense, and uh, we have these. We go see the therapist, the massage therapist. I actually have I have a therapist in my house. I call her my therapist. I have a weekly appointment with the massage therapist. But the thing is, is that I even start taking it now. Because a lot of times we, we're so high strung, we're working, we're working, we go to bed, muscles are contracted. I love that feeling. Okay, go to turn like that. But a lot of times you have a difficult time in relaxing and falling asleep, and if you're magnesium deficient, you can't relax. But if you can, you get better sleep, okay? And the, the, if you're uh, near to the level of, that you need to be for magnesium, studies are showing that you we actually set off that, or set back that sarcopenia. 
How much so, did you say the pond? You could see on the side of it. Quarter teaspoon. It's like a quarter teaspoon. Has anybody ever taken that stuff? Have you no. tried it? Oh. It's amazing. It's C A like calm, like calm down. C A L M. C A L M. Also, I want to mention one of the groups is the Okinawans. Yes. Uh, the Okinawans. Blue zone. Yeah, they they've been incredibly healthy. Yeah. But now they're getting. Yeah. They're losing they're, it. They're losing it because you know, McDonald's is there now, Burger King, yeah. and the government decided that the Okinawan children were too thin yeah. and underweight, and so they started loading them up with fat and sugar. And oh, guess no. what? Yes, so some of these blue zones are disappearing as this generation yeah. passes on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically muscular system. So we did skeletal system. Muscular system is kind of a base for all of this. Any questions on muscular system? Or well, one of my feedback? questions is, is when we're all said and done and you're talking about calcium to magnesium ratios to phosphorus and all that kind of stuff, is there going to be some way that we can um, get either our blood or saliva or whatever tested so we can kind of find out are we deficient in one or the other? Because how do you really know yeah. unless you have some sort of, say, baseline to start? That, that would be a, a good good thing to do. Yeah. We're not necessarily promoting that or doing that. No, but yeah, I know, but, just, but if somebody individually, yeah. we could contact yeah. either of you to find out. Yeah, there's some there's a lab down in Phoenix that's set up nationwide that you can go, they'll do a micronutrient analysis of your okay. blood. And then you'll tell us yeah. what to ask them yeah. to do while yeah. they, yeah, okay. Yeah. And that's a really good point, Jay, because a lot of people will kind of self-diagnose some stuff. Yeah and just go start taking a bunch of pills really yeah. not knowing yeah. what you're doing. Typically, I don't, I don't recommend doing lots of dietary supplements because you do get into that imbalance, especially if you're doing one individual nutrient at a time. You kind of tend to throw things off. And that's why we turn towards trying to get more whole foods, because the right. foods have them in a nice distribution already in the food. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Skeletal system, muscular system? We better just handle one more system tonight. Well, go ahead. We'll see how the whole I sit here all night like long. We have a lot of magnesium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So fruits and vegetables are going to be loaded with magnesium as well as wheatgrass. Right, the, the and grains. I do, and I eat all that. Yeah. I mean, I don't eat yeah. a lot of meat, but I would really like to know, and I take, you know, my calcium with magnesium. Yeah. Um, I forget what it's called, but uh, bone up. Jay. <laughs> yeah, and so some of you, like, when you think about muscle building, Dick, though, the thing you want to look at is you want to look at what do we typically think about when we think about muscle building? Eat meat. You've got to eat a lot of protein. Look at this there. We've got a breakdown. 100 calories of, of muscle tissue, basically. Uh, 8 grams of protein. 7.4 grams of fat. That's per uh, 100 calories. Okay? Now you compare that to 100 calories of broccoli. Look at the protein ratio in oh, the fat. fat. Okay. So what we're talking about is getting things in proportion. Now, typically, you wouldn't eat 100 calories. In fact, where I, where I moved here from, from Nebraska, where we have ranches and things like that, you actually get a t-shirt if you eat the big, the big cone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a contest. And then, right. How dysfunctional is that when you start turning contest to eat food? All these hot dog eating? I mean, oh! Anyway, okay. So anyway, look at what we're looking at here is balance. Okay, this would, this would probably basically serve a family of four in Okinawa, okay? This is a snack for American, okay? But we want to look at balancing these foods out. But you've got to eat a lot of broccoli to get Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, okay. So let's talk about the circulatory system, circulation. So flip your page over, we're on the back side now. In 20 minutes, we're going to try to knock out these last two. We'll see what happens, okay? Well, so talk about the circulatory system, Dick. Well, that's the, the basis of all your blood flow, and you know it's 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 such an amazing system. There are 50 to 60 thousand miles of blood vessels in the average human body. How much is that? That's circum circumnavigating the globe twice. All of that in the average human body. And whenever you start to add um, excess fats and so forth, you are putting a lot of extra stress on your circulatory system because you're you're now pumping blood through worthless tissue. Okay. Okay. So the thing about it is the most common disease associated with our circulatory system is this plaque buildup in here. Do you know what that's called? In tight inside the uh, lining of our vessels. Cholesterol. It's cholesterol plaque called atherosclerosis. Okay. And typically, how do we know if that's happening? What's the first sign of that typically? Blood pressure starts going up. 
Okay, because what happens is, is when we're born, we have real flexible tube-like uh, vessels in our body. You ever bought a new garden hose? How flexible it is? You leave it out in the sun for a while, a couple seasons, maybe you throw it out there in the winter and stuff, and you pick it up the next spring, what's, what's it like? It's real brittle and stuff like that. When we're born, our vascular system is very flexible. In fact, we actually have muscles in here in what we call the intima layer of the vessel. And it actually, when, when, our, when our vessels are pumping with our heart, it actually helps the blood go through there. But if you start putting this plaque down here, it's like putting plaster of Paris or something on the inside there. It starts stiffening it. So what's the heart have to do? It has to pump harder. And then sometimes these fracture, and sometimes they have like a vessel to the brain and have a stroke. Okay? So what we see is our circulatory system, like Dick says, we start putting a lot of fat in there, a lot of extra calcium in there. We start building up this plaque in there. We start narrowing those arteries, and the heart has to pump harder in there, so our vessels have extra pressure on them. Okay? So what are some of the arteries taking the blood from the heart to the rest of the body? Veins are returning it to the heart. Okay? Anything else about the vascular system here? No. Nope. Okay? Tone muscles in the leg. Talk about that a little bit. That's why, why is that important in the lower legs? Because uh, your calf muscles are called your second heart, and they actually help with the blood return blood flow. And so, one of the things that happens to people, and, and this can happen if somebody does a really hard cardiovascular workout, and then they just stop abruptly, they can create a cardiac episode for themselves. They're always better off to slow down and let their muscles act as the circulatory return circulatory pump keep your body going and help you to cool down so your heart's not having to take so much stress. Because if you stop, boom, automatically, it's going to create a lot of problems. So what about strengthening the muscles in the legs? What, what, do you, what could people start doing? The greatest exercise of all is squats, that I think. Because we all have to squat down and stand up sometime or another. And if you lose the ability to squat down and stand up, that's when you're going to start having problems. But one of the things I always try to get across to people is they don't squat properly. When people squat down, they jet their knees forward, and that's not what you want to do. You want to sit back into your squat, so your knees stay over your feet. And when you first start squatting, and we have our ladies, we squat, don't we? Yeah, 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 yeah. We squat because it's it's important to do. Now, now uh, both Lorna and Melissa, they're they're definitely of the senior citizen variety. And, and a couple of the other ones are too, but I don't want to talk about that. Uh, and, but <clears throat> they all squat because it's so important. You squat down, you know, and, and if you build those muscles up, it builds up your gluteus maximus, it builds up your quads, it builds up your hamstrings. It's a great exercise. And even if you can't go down very far, oftentimes you tell somebody, just find something you can squat to. Even if you just go this far, you're going to start getting a training effect, and then you start going down further and further. You know, in fact, when we talk about muscles, I'll interject this just one real quick. One time I was uh, running a wellness program, Jay, and we had like eight women who were all around 50, and they had a push-up contest. The best one did 10. Then I had this 86-year-old woman who has already had osteoporosis. She comes over and goes, can I try? And they go, sure, honey. She gets down on the floor and cranks out 18 perfect military push-ups. And so she gets up off the floor and she's going, Starts walking up. And they said, wait a minute, how'd you do that? And she goes, well, I've been following Dick's exercise program for, for like five or six years. I started doing push-ups against the wall. It was too easy, so I started doing them off my knees. That got too easy, so I usually, uh, so I had to go to regular push-ups. She goes, I usually do 20, I actually had a bad day. <laughs> okay. So, circulatory system, remember, cardiovascular disease is still the number one cause of death, not in the United States, but worldwide. Okay, so let's look at some things we can do now to optimize our circulatory system. Okay, because think about this. If you can't get oxygen to the tissue, okay, that tissue is going to die on the other side. Okay, so what we want to try to do is get ample blood flow to the whole body. So basically just take in enough fluid. Just some, some people are dehydrated. So if your blood is actually uh, too thick and you need to, in a sense, increase the circulation, just drinking plenty of fluid is the first thing you can start doing. You, everybody can do that. Okay, so make sure you're drinking enough fluid so that your urine is a pale color. Okay, if, you're, if your urine glows in the dark, you need to start adding some fluids. Okay, if it looks like Mountain Dew, okay, you need to drink some more water. Okay, that's a visual for you, right? Yeah. I mean, we're real here, right? 
Okay. Uh, now it's difficult to get your urine to pale color if you're taking a lot of water soluble vitamins. Okay, because you're peeing out in your urine. Okay. Uh, I won't breathe properly, Dick, but sitting and stick in. Posture. Right. Okay, muscular. Now, when you strengthen your muscles of your abdominal region, a lot of people talk about the core. Okay? Those types of things. Uh, how about your clothing? How many of you wear tight banded clothing? Remember those corsets they used to wear back oh. in years ago? They like, compress the organs? Yes. Okay, we want to minimize. If you take your, if you take a blouse off or your pants or something like that, and you can see the big red mark where your, where your clothing was, it was probably restricting the blood flow yeah. to those organs. Okay? Um, anything else? Well, sunlight, that's a great thing to have up there. You know, fortunately in Arizona you get that. But sunlight actually will take uh, cholesterol converted to vitamin D. And so it'll help lower the cholesterol level. And let me just bring this out real quick. And, and Jay, I know you will uh, test this. Cholesterol is not the bad guy. Do people use the term good cholesterol, bad cholesterol? Right. Uh, Professor Sutherland, if somebody has an LDL level of zero, what are they? Dead. 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 Okay. But LDL cholesterol is called the bad cholesterol. That is like soap. When you eat fats, you need that LDL cholesterol which uh, goes to the gallbladder, was converted into bile salts and bile acids, where it sits there like a soap dispenser. So when fats hit the system, it's released to emulsify the fats and allows you to, to break it down so you can digest it. <clears throat> so, then the, the high density lipoproteins, the HDL, works on the other end of the metabolic spectrum. It actually is taking fats out of the bloodstream, taking plaque out of the arteries, and taking it out of the body, so they call that good. But if you all of a sudden say, okay, I'm going to take a pill now that tells my liver, don't make cholesterol. And the body's going, uh, we need more soap. You know, it's like taking a frying pan that you use oil in and washing it only with water. And you go, well, okay, that's clean, now I'll just keep using it. What's going to happen? It's going to build up an oily residue. So when we're taking medication just to tell our liver to stop producing cholesterol, what's happening to our digestion of the, of the fats? It's bad news. Yeah, yeah. so, so you're, you're putting a Band-Aid on something, but you're not taking care of the problem. You know, when people take anti-inflammatories and so on and so forth, that's not curing the problem. Drugs do not cure. They don't. They, they're treating symptoms. You know, I, I've seen men, we've had people come through the wellness program, one guy had 17 medications, grocery bag, in his 70s, had valve replacement surgery, by, bypass surgery, uh, quintuple bypass, diabetic, uh, hypertension, and so on. In three weeks, that grocery bag was empty. And also, only four of those medications were for the problem. The other 13 were to counteract yeah. Yeah. Drugs don't heal. Let food be your medicine. And that will, and they find that. When you have somebody go through bypass surgery, but they have a 50% likelihood of having a blockage again in that first year. Mm -hmm. And when people change their lifestyle, they have a 90% success rate, 90%. And you're talking about a trinkets of money compared to how much does it cost to have an angioplast or, 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 or have the bypass surgery. I mean, it's extremely expensive. Then. Both my parents had those. Both my parents are deceased from heart disease because of lifestyle-related situations. Okay? 42. 42. Okay? So we're trying to help you get ahead of this. Now, something I want to share with you that I've been doing recently to help increase circulation is uh, when I shower, I do the normal lathering up and all that stuff and, and get cleaned up and then I use a scratchy pad, like a, one of those little loofah, loofah, okay? Mm -hmm. One of those feminine things like that. Right, right. Okay. You didn't tell me about that. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, it's stimulating the circulation and bringing the, the blood to the system and then you know what I always close on when I close the shower? Coldest water I can find that I can get. I know that doesn't sound like fun, but I tell you what, I did it before I came tonight. Okay? It, it'll actually boost, it'll open up your pores, it'll energize you, it'll like you get your circuit, you feel like you're buzzing for several hours afterwards. This is just buzzing. What's that? No, I don't do, no, do the warm before bed. Yeah. And actually, what you're doing also, you're boosting your immune system when you do that hot and cold. Hot and cold treatments, have you ever done that with oh, maybe yeah. some kind of inflammation? Yes. Physical therapists do it all the time. All the time. 
massage therapist, hot and cold, yep. hydrotherapy. Okay, so let, let's, are you, can you get 10 minutes left in you? Yeah. 15 minutes left in you? Yes. Okay, we're getting to the last one, the brain and the nervous system. Okay, Nick, talk about the brain and the nervous, number of nerve cells, all those different things. Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's really incredible. You look at the neurons, it, it's, it's uh, 600 miles long ago. And, and you take out, like if you took all the strands of DNA, you could actually go to the sun and back five times. That's 93 million miles away, one way trip. I mean, the body is absolutely incredible. So you see some basic thing, and the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, left side controls the right, and you see that when people have strokes and so forth. Uh, by the time of its birth, the baby brain consists of 10 million nerve cells. Really incredible. Spinal cord consists of around 13 million neurons. All these things are, are there to, to you know, the neural transmissions and so forth. The, the nervous system can transmit impulses about 225 miles per hour. Speed of the message transmission of the brain is as high as 180. Uh, Jane, can we go back to the previous one? Yeah. Okay. Th this is something I want to point out, and that's the, <clears throat> the dendrites and the axon, the, the cell body and the nerve membrane. I know that looks like, what does that look like? I mean, it looks like something you see in a stick drawing. Yeah. But, but actually, uh, it's very important because of those, those uh, between the dendrites and the axons are these things called butons, or they're, they're button-shaped things. Yeah, they're right in there. And what they do is they help neurotransmission happen very quickly. And let me, let me give you just a quick demonstration of changing habit, okay? So if all of you would cooperate with me just for a second, if you can get your hands free. And what I'd like you to do very simply is fold your hands like that. Just fold your hands. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is take note of which thumb you have on top. In my case, I have my left thumb on top, so does Jay. Uh, do I have any right thumbers? No, here's one here. Okay, got some right thumbers. Okay, now. Take your hands totally apart and totally reverse it. All fingers and thumb. How's that feel? Feels weird, doesn't it? So, here's the thing. When I told you to fold your hands like that, no brainer, right? You just do it, no brainer. 100 times out of 100, you're gonna do it the same way. Because something in your brain is telling you, okay, here come my hands. Okay, Dick, up, over. Now, for Lorna, it was, up, over. Okay? So we start developing a habit. We call these no-brainers because you just do them. Tying your shoes becomes a no-brainer. But then somebody has some type of traumatic brain episode, they may have to learn how to tie their shoes all over again. They have to redevelop that neurotransmission. Now, what does that mean? You have chemicals, acetylcholine, boom, boom, happens. One right after another. Rapid fire. Okay? Yeah. And let's say that habit is bad. Let's say we're smoking, or we're eating too much fat, or we're eating way too much chocolate. Oh. <laughs> and so we've developed a habit, and we say, I want to develop a new habit. I don't want to put my hands like this anymore. I want to put my hands like that. I want to start doing things right. I want to start eating right. I want to exercise on a regular basis, and so on and so forth. What happens then is you have other chemicals produced. One is called gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA, which is a neurotransmit inhibitor. So now so we're telling the one transmission, don't do it. And we're developing a new transmission that's telling us to do a healthy habit. Okay, and this is how we change to a healthy habit. And so there's strength through numbers. And you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, and pretty soon you have a new transmission set up. Now, have you ever heard the old saying, well, it's not just what I'm saying, it's true. An alcoholic is always an alcoholic. They're either recovering or they're active. But they're still an alcoholic. Why? Because if they go back and have one drink, boom, they turn that neurotransmission back on. If they have one cigarette, boom. You know? You know, we do a lot of work in the spiritual world, or, or Christianity, where we're all addicted sinners, you know? And, and so we go back to that all the time, even when we don't want to do that. We want to live a different lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle. And so we don't want to keep going backwards into our old mess. We want to change that. And so that's where support network comes in, coming to a place like this. You know, people come in here, they go, wow, I just feel good coming here. I like it here. Uh, people that have a strong spiritual life have a better chance of staying focused. That's why AA works so well. You know, and AA says, higher power than you, okay? 
They start out that way. And so you have that support group that keeps people on the track of developing a healthy habit. But when we slip backwards, we do it. And so how, and how often does this happen, Jay? Somebody goes and they have a cookie. And they go, oh, I blew it. Well, I might as well have another one. Right, no, I don't get that. <laughs> oh. Well, two is gone, might as well have a third, you know. <laughs> Stop after one. Yes. Pick yourself back up and get going back in the right direction again. But start developing the, the neurotransmissions and understand that if you go back to the old habit, that neurotransmission is still there, ready to fire. But you can start to override that, okay? Okay, so let's look at some other things. Think about your brain now. Your brain is, is the control center of the whole central nervous system. Okay, we'll look at look at the brain again. It's 75% water. All these neurons in there and so forth. So basically, again, are you getting some themes that we're coming at today? Yeah. Plenty of fluids on a regular basis. Now, one, one warning on water consumption. If you're not much of a water drinker right now, and you start increasing your fluids, start tapering off around 6 o'clock at night. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to get up during the night or basically get a catheter so it doesn't interrupt your sleep. Okay? So, but a little, little humor there to share, share with you that really, if you're going to increase your fluids, start tapering off around 6 at night. Otherwise, your kidneys are still trying to, to deal with all that extra fluid. Okay? Now, the other thing is when someone calls you a fathead, that's actually a compliment, okay? Because the brain, look at the brain is the fattest organ in the body. It's about 60% fat. So when you get called a fathead, thank, thank the person. It means you have good neurotransmissions. <laughs> okay? Uh, signals from the brain will travel down the spinal cord. So remember, the brain is the control center coming down and then going out from there. So what are some of the lifestyle habits, Dick, that we can do to optimize our nervous system and our brain? Well, as I mentioned, well, here's something you might not know. is every thought affects every cell in your body. Give me an example, drive too fast down the road and go past the police officer. Oh. <laughs> and you feel that flush from the top of your head down to the bottom of your feet. Yeah. Or, somebody pulls out in front of you. Oh. How do you react? You, you, okay, do you get mad? <laughs> and what does it take to make you mad? You know, if I, if I come over to Jay and I hit him on the arm, did I make him mad? Maybe. Maybe? What's it going to depend upon? Whether well, he hit you back. <laughs> it's going to depend on his reaction, isn't it? So, so what makes you mad, nobody can make you mad. Nobody can make you mad. Husband, wife, nobody can make you mad. You choose to get mad. And it's through a thought. And every thought affects every cell of your body. And when you have spend, if you have anger issues, or if you have negative thought process, in fact, here, here's an interesting one. If you have nothing, by age of 50, if you have nothing good to say about your parents, by age of 50, working with you. You have a 70% greater likelihood of having a serious disease. Really? Yeah. And you know, and even, even the Bible says, honor my father and mother, so what? May they be long. May they be long upon the earth. Okay. Yeah. When addressing the mental aspects of our being, we must discuss the, the ruinous effect of anger. That's what I was just talking about. You don't want to go to bed with your anger. Here's something that's so important. I mean, what's somebody, so many people are out there taking drugs. And a lot of the people that go out there and committing these, and if you've noticed, if you see the pictures in the paper of these people who go out and do these heinous crimes where they go in and shoot things up and so on and so forth. I was showing a picture to Lisa one time, and she goes, well, that looks like the same person that did the other thing. No, no, you're looking at the eyes. You ever notice the eyes? Yeah. They just have this, this cold, vacant stare. And a lot of times these people are on psycho meds. And, and so here's the sad thing. You know, someone like Prozac, which is marked up basically 250,000% and was developed with a government grant. And what it's doing is it's, it's masking the depression. It's keeping you there. It's helping you deal with it, but it's basically keeping you there. Two thirds of all depression could be reversed with just regular exercise. Three times a week for a couple months. And wow, the depression's gone. And some of the people that are coming in here working out, they're starting to notice already that not only do they feel better physically, they feel better mentally, don't they? Absolutely. Okay? So I'm going to talk on this just for a second here. There's a, there's a uh, close association between inflammation in your body and depression. It affects the brain. Okay? We just completed a 12-week study 
with uh, 90 some people from Verde Valley Medical Center, Flagstaff Medical Center, and Northern Arizona University, all employees. We did a 12 week intervention this last spring. Last year we did a six week intervention. This is a pilot program with 35 employees from NAU. We do all these worksite wellness. And basically, we, all we change is their dietary habits. We told them to continue to exercise what they've been doing, and naturally they felt better, so they exercised a little bit more. And so what we found at the end of six weeks with 35 people, 12 weeks with 76 people that finished the study, when we got done with them, their depressive symptoms dropped in half. And these were not extremely depressed people. These were only mildly depressed people. All we changed was their dietary habits. We brought down their inflammation by putting them on a more basic diet, okay, drinking fluids, all these things we're talking about. This, we just finished these studies, so we're, this one's been accepted for a publication in a research journal. Now we're taking our, our data from the 12-week study. Well, all we did is change their dietary habit, and, and basically what we see is people say that they no longer have the inflammation, okay, so the inflammation goes right with the depression. And when you take the inflammation out, then you can also get up and start moving, and you feel better, and things like that. Your cognitive uh, functioning is better, and uh, the overall blood flow to the body is better. So that, that's the kind of stuff that's right here. Uh, so people basically we work with the vet center in Cottonwood because they're hooked up with Flagstaff Medical Center, and so we work with we're working with a lot of the employees right now in changing their dietary habits. Jay, can you describe or explain the G bombs plus T? Okay. Yeah. Did you have a question? Someone had a question. Uh, she's number six. Please that other one first. Cognitive distortions. Here's what I'm going to no, do. Self talk. <laughs> let's, turn, let's hand these off, Chloe. I'm going to talk about G bombs tonight. Uh, I have a colleague. Uh, how many of you have you've heard the name Joel Furman? He's a physician. He's on PBS. Joel Furman and I are uh, uh, professional partners on on doing research studies. In fact, Dr. Furman's uh, foundation funded this six-week study last year. So we work with that a lot, and Dr. Furman has come up with a formula on how to choose foods. Now, some of you are getting close to retirement, right? <laughs> you guys know what ROI stands for? Return on investment. Your return on investment. If I, if I invest $5 in a business or a company or the stock market, do I want three bucks back? What do I want? I want, I want maybe 10 or more, right? So you want a return on investment. I want you to start thinking about your food as ROI. If I'm going to put money and put this in my body, what am I going to get a return on investment? On the right-hand column here, we have foods with numbers, right? Dr. Furman has come up with a formula to determine how many micronutrients there are basically per bite of food. And the more, the more nutrients micronutrients in the food, the higher the score. So it's number of nutrients per calories. Does that make sense? It's a formula. So if I eat 100 calories, what am I going to get back for that? Well, in the right-hand column here, if you drink a bunch of colas, wine and beer, french fries, have you ever heard of these foods? Have you ever seen these foods anywhere? Yeah. Can you get those in Camp Verde? Do you have to fly those in from Scottsdale or someplace? <laughs> Can you buy these here? Okay, look at the numbers over here. These are the foods I grew up on. These are the foods that Dick just got done talking about eating two pounds of and two dozen of, right? So the number of nutrients you're getting back per bite of those foods, the lower the number, the lower the nutrients. So is this cooked? Either way. Either way. Yeah, okay. Okay. yeah. Now look at the middle column. Have you ever seen those foods? Oh, yeah. Are those designer foods that you have to have flown in from Scottsdale, or can you get those around here? Yeah, they're all here. You got to drive to Cottonwood to get those? Or could you get them right here in Camp Verde? Just right here. Right here, okay? So as, the, as you see the numbers going up, you're getting a better return on your investment. We use this tool in our six-week and our 12-week study, okay? And we told people, it's not like you can never eat these foods in the right-hand column again. I'm not asking you to cut the paper up when you get home and cut off the right-hand column. <laughs> but if you're hanging out over here in the right-hand column, I want you to start eating foods from the center column at every meal and eat them first in the meal, just like when you introduce foods to kids when they're the hungriest, okay? Now, if you're really adventurous and you really want to get the return on investment, look at the left-hand column. Has anybody ever eaten kale? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know what kale was growing up. I used to run over, I used to run over my grandpa, I used to mow my grandparents' lawn, 
and I saw all these foods that I didn't like, and I I try to inch up to them with, with the lawnmower. <laughs> Whoops! Hey, I check out check out your pepper plant. Now that I have to buy them, I love them. Okay. So look at that. I always like to compare. What's your favorite green leafy vegetable? Kale. Kale. kale? Spinach. spinach. Okay, so you can look at that. Take kale. Look at. Let's just take spinach at 739. 739. You can either have one serving of spinach at 739, or you can have 739 cans of cola yeah. to get the equivalent of micronutrients. Okay. So all we do is we use this tool right here, and we help guide people over a six-week, 12-week period to start making dietary changes. And then that's the results we were talking about, over a 50% reduction in depressive symptoms in our research studies. Okay? And we saw their lipids come down, their, their cholesterol, their triglycerides. We've seen their, their C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory marker in the body, just by shifting to the left. Okay? Now, in Flagstaff, it's not hard to get people to lean to the left. Okay? Oh, God. Okay? <laughs> Well, that's a political joke. <laughs> I'm not just, I'm not recommending leaning to the left politically. I mean, this is totally nutrition, okay? But really, if you can start, in every meal, start choosing food on the left-hand side, and then eventually, in the next few weeks, end up hanging out on the Green Island over here, that's the best place. That's your greatest return on your investment of food. Okay? Now, what is a G-bomb? Dr. Furman came up with a neat acronym that he says that we should eat every single day based on research studies. The G stands for greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds and nuts, and then he added T in there recently, tomatoes. So you want a G bomb every day. Onions, I, I had no idea. Cook the onions though. Yeah, they, yeah. cook the onions for better nutrient absorption. Oh, sure. G-bombs, okay? So you want to drop a G-bomb plus T every day. Okay, there you go. Let's wrap it up. Well, I think you've done a pretty good job of uh, putting it all together there. The, the, the basic foundation of this whole thing, it isn't going to take an elaborate program in order to get your health back. It's actually quite simple quite basic, get enough water, eat nutrient-dense foods, get some exercise. And think positive. Think positive, <laughs> and great things will happen. And you know, that's, you know, that's one of the things, you know, people think, like they'll look at me and they'll think I spend hours working out. I don't. I lift weights for 15 minutes three times a week. That's why the business is called Fit 15. Can we give you a workout in 15 minutes? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, it just, and then they do their cardio. I do much more time on cardio than I do, uh, do on weights. And Jay, he's a runner, Chloe's a runner. Uh, Lisa, like me, is a, a lifter, and we, we both did our cardio as well. But what Lisa and I do is we have what we call our gorilla salad. You know, we put in uh, cabbage and uh, red cabbage, purple cabbage, mm -hmm. and all the peppers, and we put in kale and spinach and so on and so forth. And so we have nutrient-dense foods all the time. Some of you have seen my gorilla salad. But it, it just made such a big difference in my life. I mean, uh, I, I felt the good Lord impressed me several years ago to get in the best shape of my life. And I go, why at 60? You know, why couldn't I do this at 30? Because a lot of people can do it at 30. Do it at 60. Okay. Uh, just, just a pointer. Um, uh, you know, I don't buy collards and greens and, you know, in great bulk or anything. But it actually, she can get these little things that have got all these different types of these oh, really high intense foods all in one little box. Pre washed and, and ready to go. Yeah, they do have that. What you can do is just take some and put it on your sandwich every day. Yeah. And it's a lot easier than, you know, wasting a whole bunch of. And we do use that with stuff in Yeah. yeah. We'd like to try and get them to get some more healthy stuff in there. Yeah. Uh, we had a little uh, lady in Rapid City who. Um, was able to get the Safeway there to just load the place with all sorts of healthy foods and so and we can have that happen at Bashes. Just, so just ask them. I ask them for stuff and they've carried it. So just, okay. just ask okay. them. They're very good with that. Mm -hmm. So we appreciate you very much coming tonight. I hope you've learned a few things along the way. And uh, <laughs> tomorrow night is not a repeat of tonight. We continue on. And uh,